Okay, so um, good evening and welcome um, to this webinar. Um, this e the topic for this evening's webinar is about renewable energy, and it's um, it's really just a, a sort of introductory um, thing. So we skim over a number of different technologies. Um, so I, what I'll do is I'll um, I'll talk a little bit about what we're going to do this evening. So first of all, um, I'll talk a little bit about Mesh Energy, who are the company that I work for. Um, and what we do. Uh, we're then going to touch on a case study um, of a development that Mesh were involved in um, down in Hampshire, um, a little village called Privet. We're then going to touch on some of the key uh, renewable heating technologies, uh, so ground source heat pumps, air source heat pumps, and biomass. Then we're going to look at some of the supporting uh, technologies to them, so solar PV. Uh, battery storage and uh, mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. Then we'll go through some of the specification and design considerations, um, the sort of things that, that as architects we would um, hope that you'd consider before um, uh, with any sort of new build or retrofit project which involves these technologies. Then we'll have a little touch on some of the government subsidies that are available. Um, to support some of these technologies. And then finally, um, a little look at, you know, how you can, um, what the sort of next steps are, um, if you decide you want to use some of these, um, how to get them specified uh, so they're, they're used their most optimum. So who are Mesh Energy? Well, Mesh Energy are a small independent energy consultancy. Uh, we're based down in Farnham in Surrey. Um, and our purpose is um, to inspire and forge a sustainable legacy. So what we try and do is, is really we try and offer sort of a, um, a holistic independent design um, service uh, for people who are considering um, renewable options on their, on their projects. Um, and what we try and do is, is sort of decluster the market, because if you speak to people who have an, an affiliation with a particular technology or product, um, then clearly they're going to have, um, they're going to try and sell you that product. Um, we're not affiliated to any particular product, any particular technology. Um, what we try and do is we just try and advise people on, you know, what the best combination of technologies is for their particular needs, their particular project, their particular building. Um, and we aim to support at every stage. And there's a slide right at the end, which um, shows how that sort of ties up with the different REBA stages. So as I said, we'd, um, we'd first of all look at a case study, and, and this case study is of a brand new build um, house um, down in Privet in Hampshire. Um, it's a pretty big house, 650 square metres uh, of gross internal floor area. Um, and what we were aiming to do is we were aiming to um, take the property that had been there before was running on an oil boiler, and we wanted to get rid of oil from site, um, deliver of cost savings to the client, um, deliver a really good payback to the clients um, and also um, you know give us a, a very very good environmental um, outlook uh, as well um, to do that we used a mixture of different technologies um, so a ground source heat pump for the main space heating in the house an air source heat pump to heat the swimming pool um, a solar PV um, array uh, on the ground um, to provide electricity to the site and we also advise, help them with obtaining the government subsidies, um, which gave a, a total annual saving of about £3,000 a year over what the equivalent system would have cost on oil. Um, and the total subsidy that they'll receive over the life of the project will be um, in excess of £80,000. So some fairly you know, big numbers there. Um, obviously, you know, this is a very large property you know, and was finished to a very, very high standard. Um, but it but it is typical of the kind of thing we get involved in, but just at a bigger scale. Um, so a lot of the things that you can see in this project um, would equally apply um, to much smaller, uh, much more modest projects. And the other thing to remember is is one of the reasons we've chosen this as a case study is because it has a, quite an array of different technologies um, and some quite interesting things. Uh, if you ever um, get the chance to hear our overheating webinar then there's then this this features in that as well um because we'd use some quite innovative um ventilation systems on this on this building 
So this slide talks about, uh, shows some of the uh, different technologies that we installed. Um, so the uh, slide the, on the left here, uh, we have got the ground source heat pump um, with the buff tank in the foreground. Um, the ground source heat pump as well, just a, as a little bit of a more of a sort of close up of some of the pipe work behind it um, is in the is in the top middle. Um, the solar PV array, uh, as you can see, was uh, sort of blended in with the um, existing glass house on site, um, and that's providing electricity to the site. And, and obviously, any excess is then exported to the grid. Um, and at the time, that that was eligible for um, the feed-in tariff. Um, that's now been replaced, but there is is a similar scheme in place. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see um, the air source heat pump and the air source heat pump uh, was used for heating the swimming pool. So why did we use some of those different technologies and why did we choose, for example, to use the ground source for the space heating and the air source uh, for the pool heating? Well, hopefully the next few slides should answer some of those questions. So what is a ground source heat pump? Well. It's basically uh, a very large, or all heat pumps are very large refrigeration systems. And what they're doing is they are um, like a, ref a refrigerator moves heat from the inside of your, your fridge to the outside. Um, a ground source or air source heat pump um, moves low grade heat from outside the home, um, concentrates it and makes it into high grade heat that you can use for heating on domestic hot water and moves that heat into, into the building where you're wanting to heat. So what they do is they, they use a electricity, uh, a refrigeration cycle, um, and effectively what the refrigeration cycle does is it concentrates that low grade heat. And obviously that electricity comes at a cost, um, but typically for every kilowatt hour of electricity you put into a ground source heat pump, you'll get between three and a half and five kilowatts of heat out of the system. Um, so the remainder, obviously, you can't create heat. The remainder is what you're drawing from the environment. And where does that um, where does that heat get collected from? Well, if you look on the right hand side here, you've got these uh, large um, coils, and these have um, a mixture of water and glycol pumped through these coils, and they are continuously picking up um, heat from the ground, um, which then is is um, concentrated by the heat pump. And that heat is replenished over the summer by the sun shining on the ground. Um, so effectively, you're turning your, your, your back lawn into a very large solar collector. Um, what are the benefits? Well, the, um, the main benefit is it's cheaper to run than an, an equivalent oil boiler system. Um, they are eligible for quite generous subsidies from the government. Um, those subsidies uh, will go on until at least um, March next year um, when the domestic RHI uh, closes, um, although it looks likely there'll be some sort of replacement scheme for that, which may not be quite as generous, but um, will certainly still um, offer quite a good return. And um, one of the other advantages of a ground source heat pump is there, is there are basically no planning constraints um, in almost all um, in almost all cases, um, so if you need a if you've got a new building, you need it heated, um, then you will almost certainly um, not have planning issues um, with using a ground source heat pump. Uh, the downsides of heat pumps, which aren't mentioned on this slide, um, you can see that if you use flat loop collectors, which are probably the cheapest system to install, um, then they do need quite a lot of ground area. Um, there are alternative collector methods, um, which just use boreholes or uh, use um, groundwater um, as, their, as their heat source. Um, but they tend to be a little bit more expensive to install, um, but they can give slightly lower running costs. So, you know, you sort of have to balance that out. Okay, an air source heat pump. Um, an air source heat pump is, is very much a similar beast to a ground source. Um, the main difference is that rather than collecting the heat, the low grade heat um, from the, the earth around the building, um, you collect it from the air um, that surrounds the building instead. And that means you have to have a fan unit um, you have a large heat exchanger within the fan unit. And, um, and with that um, comes some advantages and some disadvantages. The main advantage of a ground of an air source heat pump over a ground source heat pump 
is that they are significantly cheaper to install. Um, they're significantly less um, disruptive to the site because you're not having to drill boreholes or dig horizontal collectors in. Um, but they, because they are reliant on the temperature of the air to give them the heat, um, they um, will vary in efficiency throughout the season. And unfortunately, the time they're least efficient is when it's coldest. And obviously when it's coldest is when you need the most heat. So it's, um, it's a bit of a swings and roundabout thing. But, but don't be sort of scared by air source heat pumps. People think, well, you know, it's going to get really cold outside. There's no useful heat. Um, but, but air source heat pumps will deliver useful heat all the way down to minus 25 degrees um, or even lower, depending on the choice of refrigerant. So you know, an air source heat pump will always work. Um, it's just a question of making sure that, that you design the air source heat pump system um, for the climate that it's going into. Um, the UK is a particularly good place for air source heat pumps. Um, that's for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of which is we have quite mild winters, um, although it sometimes doesn't feel like it. Um, the UK is actually pretty mild considering its, its latitude. Um, London is on approximately the same latitude as Moscow, um, but obviously we don't get the extremes of temperature, um, thanks in part to the Gulf Stream, and thanks in part to the fact we have a maritime climate. Um, the other thing is it's quite a wet environment as well. And, um, and the humidity in the air actually also helps slightly boost the, um, the coefficient of performance, that efficiency of, of an air source heat pump in the UK. So giving a, a sort of rough, um, a, a rough sort of idea of costs, um, air source heat pumps start from around £6,000. Um, obviously, a, a sort of standard boiler installation might be a couple of thousand, so they're a bit more expensive. Um, but running costs tend to be a bit lower than gas. Um, there's minimal groundworks involved um, and you may require planning permission. Um, so it's worth checking with a planning specialist, but, but basically if you have more than one heat pump, you are definitely going to need planning permission. If you're very going to put your heat pump very close to the boundary of the property or the external unit for your heat pump very close to the boundary of the property, you're going to need planning permission, um, but otherwise you're probably going to be okay. Okay. Third, the third technology we're going to look at is one that's slightly fallen out of favour, um, but still works really well on some properties, um, especially properties which um, are in very rural locations and um, properties that have um, existing heating systems which are optimised for very high flow temperatures. Um, one of the disadvantages of a, a heat pump is that generally speaking, they won't provide super high flow temperatures or if they do allow for super high flow temperatures um, then um, then the efficiency you're going to get from them is is low you remember you're in a with a heat pump you're relying on um, boosting a low grade heat and turning it into high grade heat um, and that and that's that's um, sort of I guess you call it sort of amplification of the heat uh, comes at a cost and that's the electrical cost that you're putting into it um, so the higher, the hotter you make the, the heating water, the more it's going to cost you in electricity. With a biomass boiler, you're getting high grade heat straight out of the, out of the, out of the tin. Um, you're, but you are burning something, you're physically setting fire to something, um, albeit it's a renewable resource. You know, wood grows, it takes carbon in, it sequesters carbon during its lifetime. When you burn it, it releases that carbon again. So theoretically, it's carbon neutral. There's obviously some carbon associated with actually harvesting that wood and processing it and turning it into wood chips or, or into wood pellets, um, which are typically burned in, an, in a wood chip boiler or a wood pellet boiler. Um, but, they, but they are um, basically carbon neutral. Uh, in terms of running costs, um, they are, tend to be a little bit cheaper to run than oil boilers. Um, they do take more maintenance than an oil boiler. Um, but they, um, uh, and they tend to be a little bit more expensive to install initially than an oil boiler. Um, the main disadvantage of biomass for a lot of projects is simply the bulk of um, the size of the fuel. Um, so, so you can see on the, in the right hand um, photo here, a fuel hopper um, for a pellet boiler. Um, so the two pipes at the top are where you can actually blow the pellets into this hopper. 
and then you can see the pipe coming out the bottom is where the um is where the boiler takes the um the, the pellets from and takes it into the boiler itself um that is obviously you know that's quite a big thing and you've also got to put that somewhere and that's not going to be practical um if you live in the middle of a city or something um People get concerned about things like Clean Air Act and um, those kind of things in sort of less rural locations. Um, but in most cases, you're burning this fuel very, very cleanly. So they're Clean Air Act exempt um, for most of the um, better quality boilers that are on the market. Uh, the Froling boilers that are pictured here are particularly good quality items. So now we've run through the sort of main three main heat sources. Let's look at some of the other technologies that sit around those. Um, obviously, you know, the UK is a heat dominated country. Um, the, for the majority of the year, we're we're heating our homes. Um, we're not we're not we don't generally need to cool houses particularly. Um, if you are needing to cool your house, you probably uh, need to look at the uh, at some of the other design implications, you know, some of the other pieces of design, um, because you should be able to pass the TM59 um, overheating analysis fairly comfortably um, with a bit of clever design, a bit of careful shading, careful choice of orientation, G values of windows, that kind of thing. So you shouldn't need to be cooling um, domestic buildings particularly. Um, so let's look at supporting technologies to sit alongside these heat sources we've talked about. Probably the first and most obvious one is solar PV. Um, so solar PV is a, um, a system which generates electricity. Um, it basically, uh, sunlight uh, is shone onto a photoelectric cell. That electric, photoelectric cell generates a voltage. That voltage can be used um, to generate a current and that current um, can then be used to power electrical, item, electrical things around the house. Um, the panels themselves generate direct current, so DC, um, so that's the same as comes out of a battery. Um, and then you have an inverter that converts that um, DC current into AC current, which is what comes out of your plug sockets. Um, that's all done on site. Um, it's uh, pretty um, self-sufficient. Um, you install the system. The performance will degrade very gently over the course of the life of the system. Uh, generally, um, inverters last about 10 years and the panels themselves last between 20 and 25 years. Um, and you're getting a return on investment of around 10%. So, so for the first 10 years, your system is paying for itself. And after that, it's making you a profit is the, is the sort of simple, simplistic way of doing of looking at it. Um, that does rely on getting the system sized correctly. Um, so what you want to do is you want to try and balance how much energy you're using on site um, against the size of the panels. And obviously um, that's that's easier said than done because um, what you don't want to be doing is you don't want to be selling too much electricity back to the national grid because they don't pay you very much for it. And equally, you don't want to be buying in any more electricity from the national grid than you really need to. And electricity is difficult to store um, but we'll look at a, a technology that might help with that in a moment uh, costs for installation we say between three and seven seven thousand pounds obviously the bigger the solar pv array you put in um, the more expensive it becomes and if you try and put in very small pv arrays uh, then they don't tend to be particularly um, economically efficient simply because the um, because it's by the time you've got the building scaffolded and, and gone through all the sort of preemptive stuff that you need to actually get the system installed, um, it, it sort of absorbs so much of the uh, so much of the sort of potential profit from the system. Um, but they're they're a good little system. Um, lots of you know most most houses we uh, we specify work on now uh, we end up specifying PV because it it's such a, an economically sensible thing to do. So battery storage is probably the, the sort of new kid on the block. Um, you'll see uh, the Tesla Powerwall we've got here um, pictured. Um, Tesla are probably the leading um, sort of household name, I guess you sort of say in, in battery storage. Um, so what does, a, what does a battery actually do? Well, as I said with PV, electricity, one of the big limitations of electricity is it's very hard to store electricity. Um, 
the national grid has no capability in any sort of meaningful way of storing electricity. I mean, you could sort of look at pumped storage power stations like the Norwig. Um, you know, there's, there's a limited amount of battery capacity, but basically you generate electricity, you have to use it then and there. You can't put it aside for later. And that's where a battery comes in because a battery does allow you to, to, to store electricity for use at a, a later time. Um, where do batteries work really well? They work really well when you have a, um, a, a sort of typical couple, I guess you might call them, um, who go out to work in the morning, um, their PV system sitting on the roof of their house all day, it's generating electricity. Um, that electricity, they're not using electricity, they're not at home, they've not got the, the, the oven on, the, you know, the dishwasher's not on, the washing machine's not on. Um, all those things that use electricity aren't running. Um, so that electricity is just being exported to the grid. Well, if they're saving that up in the battery, then when they get home in the evening, their battery can then discharge and they can use that electricity um, to, um, to power you know, their TV and their ovens and all the rest of the things they need um, for, their, um, for their evening at home. Um, it is possible to uh, use... Um, to play the market with the with electricity so the wholesale price of electricity varies throughout the day um, so although as consumers we're quite used to paying a fixed amount for each kilowatt hour of electricity that we use um, that's not actually how electricity is priced um, in the wholesale market and it is possible to play that market so that when electricity is cheap uh, we buy electricity and we charge our battery with it. And when electricity is expensive, we sell to the grid and we actually make a profit from doing that. Um, we talk also on this slide about the fact that you can potentially use um, the battery to provide electricity during a power cut. Um, obviously, the UK is, is generally has a pretty stable electricity supply. We don't have many long power cuts. Um, you know, people who live at the end of an overhead line might uh, might disagree with me on that. But generally speaking, we've got a pretty stable um, electricity supply. Um, but but what a what a battery storage system can do is it, it can allow you to island um, from the the mains grid, um, so that if there is an electricity power, if there is a power cut, it may be possible to um, power at least essential services within the house um, from your battery. Um, what I would say is, please don't mistake um, domestic battery storage with uninterruptible power supplies. They are different things. Um, if you're running a business critical server or um, a life support machine or something that's really, really important, doesn't go off, this is not the same as an uninter uninterruptible power supply. But it, it's good enough for, you know, it, you'll, you'll notice a flicker as the system switches over, um, but, but it's uh, pretty good. Uh, currently, there's no subsidies for batteries, um, but uh, the technology is improving all the time. They're getting cheaper, um, and I think we'll see more and more batteries cropping up on, on projects um, as we go along. So this is a sort of slightly different, we're going off on a slightly different tack now with, with MVHR. Um, I'm sure an awful lot of you will have started to see MVHR um, more and more on, on new projects um, and we'll have some understanding of what MVHR is and, and what it does. But basically, if, if you're designing a high efficiency um, home, any kind of building, um, one of the ways to make a building highly efficient is to um, control unintended infiltration um, as tightly as you can. So build, so build tight, ventilate right, as the old adage goes. And if you build an airtight building, you need to provide ventilation to that building. Um, so typically, where we're looking at um, homes where the air tightness figure is below about five meters cubed per meter square per hour, which is which is kind of um, where building regs sits about at the moment. Um, if we're looking between sort of five and three, MVHR is about cost neutral. Below three, we're, we're getting a serious advantage from from specifying MVHR. So what does MVHR do? Well, basically what MVHR does is instead of having a little fan in, in the wall of your bathroom, 
um, and in your utility room and in your kitchen, what you're doing is you're extracting the warm air out of those rooms into a central system. You're then passing that warm air through a heat exchanger. And on the other side of that heat exchanger is all the air that you're bringing into the home um, to provide ventilation to your living spaces. So your bedroom, your living room, your dining room, they all need an air supply. So you're extracting out from one area, taking the heat out of that, that, that waste, damp, you know, smelly air from the kitchen and bathrooms, and you're using that heat to reheat the air that's coming back into the building. Um, very, very highly efficient systems. Um, the amount of electricity the fans use is fairly negligible when compared to the energy they can save. Um, absolutely essential in airtight buildings to um, maintain indoor air quality. Um, in fact, they can they, these systems tend to improve indoor air quality quite significantly over um, naturally ventilated houses because the air is all filtered as it comes into the house. So particularly good, if, for example, if you've got somebody who has hay fever um, because you can specify um, pollen filters, um, which obviously reduce... Um, Reduce allergens coming into the house. Um, so there's, there's lots of advantages. Typically, you would get a reduction on a very high efficiency house of around 30% on heating costs. Um, and they give you know very, very low running costs. And if they're designed correctly, the MVHR system is incredibly quiet. Um, we have a whole separate um, uh, masterclass uh, webinar on, on our YouTube channel. Uh, well, I go through this in a lot more detail. Um, so if you're interested, then then have a look at the, a look for that. I'll share some links um, at the end. So let's have a, a quick a quick look at spec and design. Um, so these are the kind of things that, as architects, hopefully you would be considering when specifying any of these technologies. So first of all, let's look at our ground source heat pump again. So Electrical supply, it can be one of the big um, stumbling blocks um, with ground and air source heat pumps. Um, as a general rule of thumb, if you've got a reasonably well insulated house, if you are, if you've got a gross internal floor area of less than around 300 square meters, then a single phase supply is probably going to be okay. If you're over 300 square meters, then you may well be looking at a three phase supply. Now, these are very, very approximate numbers, um, and they do vary from site to site, and they do vary depending upon the type of other equipment that you've got in, in the house. So, for example, if you cook on electric, if you've got electric showers, if you've got electric vehicle car chargers, all those kind of things, then it might be that the, you need a three-phase supply sooner than 300 square metres. Equally, if you've got a very well-insulated house, but your cooking is predominantly on natural gas and you've not got electric showers and you know th there's other things um, then it may well be that you can go significantly above 300 square meters and and get away with a single phase supply um, generally speaking for biomass boilers um, a single phase su supply is absolutely fine uh, for solar pv um, single phase um, will be fine for a typical domestic installation uh, if you start getting into very large um, installations where you might be exporting quite a lot of electricity back to the grid, um, then you may need to start looking at a three-phase uh, supply to allow you to do that without having to obtain permission from the uh, DNO, the distrib distribution network operator. Um, ground source heat pumps. Um, so the first thing to look at is um, the, the space available for horizontal ground loops. So as I said to you earlier, the horizontal ground loop system is the cheapest system to install. Um, and that is because basically all you need to install it is some pipe and a digger. And you dig a hole um, or you dig some trenches, you lay the pipe into the trenches. Those, those trenches are between one and 1.2 meters deep typically. You fill the, the, put the pipe in the bottom, fill it back up. Um, get all the air out of the system and uh, and you're away um it's fantastic if you've got a, a paddock behind your behind your uh, behind the, the building you're trying to heat um if you've got uh, a you know a very very large lawn um then it's a 
fantastic system. Um, as a rule of thumb, we usually say two to three times the floor area is an absolute minimum um, uh, amounts of land that you need to have available. Um, you, there are some limitations about where you can put these, um, these horizontal loops as well. So you can't put them under impervious um, paved areas. And the reason for that is that rainwater is one of the main things that helps the system recharge um, during the summer. So when warm rainwater falls on the ground and it percolates through, that brings heat into the ground, which you then pull out during the following winter. Um, the other thing is that you can't plant um, heavy trees and things above. So, you know, you can have grass, you can have um, small shrubs, those kind of things, but you can't start planting trees um, above the, the ground loops because the roots can actually damage the pipework. And as you can imagine, if you get a leak in this pipework, it can be a real nightmare to try and find, which is why you'll see all these pipes, one continuous length of pipe. Um, within the plant room itself or in the, the space that you've allocated for plants, you're going to probably need for a ground source heat pump at least three square meters. Um, you'll see that the photo on the right hand side here is a pretty uh, a pretty compact installation uh, with a with a buffer tank, um, a domestic hot water cylinder on the right hand side and the heat pump in the middle. Um, uh, you know, that could be compacted even a little bit more, but you're looking at about three square meters as an absolute minimum. And you will need you know, that space from floor to ceiling. Um, the domestic hot water cylinder is likely to be a bit bigger than the equivalent one for a boiler. Um, and the, obviously the buffer tank, you wouldn't need that with a, with a conventional gas boiler. So you're taking up a little bit more space than you would be with a gas boiler. For air source heat pumps, um, you're gonna need an outside unit. Um, typically that has a footprint of around a couple of square meters. Um, you want to put that that uh, outdoor unit away from social areas. Obviously, there's a fan on that that, that which does make a little bit of noise, um, and it also blows cold air out. You know, you're you're taking air in one side of a heat exchanger, you're taking heat out of it. So the air that's coming out the other side is is quite cool. Um, that's probably quite nice if you're sitting out in the middle of a hot sunny day and you've got nice cool air blowing on you. Um, but you know, in the shoulder seasons, in that October, November, you know, time when when you're still just about sitting outside in a in a warm jumper in the evening, um, enjoying that last barbecue, you certainly don't want cold air being blown on you. Um, you need to think about um, condensate drainage. Um, you know, you're passing air over a cold heat exchanger. Um, you will get some condensate coming off that. That condensate's got to go somewhere, so you've got to think about condensate drainage, and uh, you've also got to think about what you're going to connect to inside the house and air source heat pumps come essentially in two flavors you get what they call a split system where um, there's a refrigerant pipe work that connects the outdoor unit with the indoor unit and the indoor unit contains um, the heat exchanger that, that that between the heating water and the refrigeration side and you have a monoblock units where everything is in the outside unit and you are putting heating water or a mix of glycol and heating water through um, through that outdoor unit. Um, monoblock units are typically the ones that most installers like to fit um, for a number of reasons, one of which is you don't need to have an in internal unit, so it's space saving. Uh, secondly, you don't need to have any special refrigeration gas um, qualifications to fit them. Uh, so a plumber can fit them. You don't need to be um, a, a refrigeration engineer to, to, to fit them. Um, and the third reason is um, that they that because they are manufactured in greater numbers, they are they can also be a little bit cheaper and more available. Uh, solar PV um, and solar thermal. Um, this applies equally to both. We, we obviously haven't gone through solar thermal. Um, and the reason I haven't touched on solar thermal is that generally speaking, um, the economic benefit of solar PV is usually better than solar thermal. So I've ignored solar thermal for the sake of trying to keep things uh, reasonably, uh, reasonably brief. Um, solar PV can be ground or roof mounted. Um, you can go on a pitch roof, it can go on a flat roof. Um, 
generally speaking if you go on a flat roof you you need to uh, you have a ballasted system although you can fix through the roof on a pitched roof you would always fix back to the structure of the roof uh, ground mounted uh, again there's lots of different ways of doing ground mountings um, but generally they they will be set onto some sort of screw or foundation on the ground um, the absolute ideal is that the array faces due south um, and you will get a small degradation in performance um, as you move away from from due south um, at the extremes if you had a if you had an east west split um, then you'd lose about 11 percent in performance um, the absolute ideal inclination is between 30 and 40 degrees um, on a flat roof you want to maintain at least 10 degrees and the reason for that is that um, the panels self clean with rainwater and so you have to have a sufficient angle for the rainwater to run off the panels um, and actually self clean the panels. So the top um, top tips for uh, for all these technologies and this, is, this says you know for MVHR but, uh, but but for all technologies is I'd say design these systems in early. Um, for MVHR particularly, I'm not quite sure where this slide's come from actually. It seems to have been dropped into the wrong presentation. Um, but this, this is actually quite true. Um, consider how the ducts are going to, to in it with MVHR are going to pass around the structure. Um, insulate uh, all the duct work. Allow for condensate drainage, that equally applies to air source heat pumps. Um, allow for filter changing on MVHR. Um, allow for system balancing and commissioning. I'm really not sure why, why the slides dropped into this presentation, but uh, but I'll go through it anyway. Um, allow for silence as a manifold. So obviously there's, you know, again, that's kind of the duct work, um, duct work sizing. And um, MVHR systems should always be within the env uh, envelope of the building. Um, you have to separate the inlet and outlet supply and an extract by at least two meters and keep uh, inlet ducts away from uh, pollution and strong winds. Not quite sure where that came from, but uh, but uh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Rogue slide has, has slipped into the uh, presentation. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, government subsidies. Um, so at the moment, that the main source of government subsidy is the domestic renewable heat incentive. Um, there was also a non-domestic renewable heat incentive, um, but bearing in mind that it ends um, for new applications at the end of this month, um, it seems unlikely you're going to be able to get a, a project um, designed, delivered and installed and commissioned um, within the next 27 or 28 days. Um, so I think we can probably fairly safely ignore that. Um, so the domestic renewable heat incentive at the moment is open for applications until March 2022. So we've just got just over a year of it left. And it works on the basis that you are paid for each um, kilowatt hour of, um, of renewable heat that your system uh, generates um, up to a maximum um, amount. So for an air source heat pump, uh, the maximum amount that you can get over seven years is £10,100 and that is paid at a rate of 10.71 pence per kilowatt hour. Uh, the payments are made quarterly, uh, they're tax free um, and as I say that that amount is paid over seven years so you'll get uh, four lots of seven which is 28, 28 payments over your seven years um, and, and the maximum total of that can be £10,100. You'll see that the ground source heat pump, the maximum amount is actually a bit higher and also the amount you get paid per kilowatt hour is a bit higher. And the idea of, of all these things is that the, the amount you get paid per kilowatt hour is meant to reflect the cost of installation. So more expensive technologies to install get a higher amount of money. Um, the reason for the difference between the 32,000 and the 10,100 is partly to reflect the fact that you get more per kilowatt hour of ground source, but also that ground source heat pumps tend to suit larger installations and air source heat pumps tend to suit smaller installations. So it's again, it's trying to push people in the sort of right direction with that. Um, you'll see that solar thermal gets a particularly generous amount per kilowatt hour. 
um, but also has the lowest cap um, and also probably gives you the smallest number of kilowatt hours. So although it, it at first glance looks very appealing, actually, when you start doing the sums, uh, you don't get a huge amount from it. So what's the next steps? Um, I mean, obviously, Mesh Energy, you know, we're a consultancy. This is this is what we do every day. We talk to architects, we talk to householders, we talk to um, people who are developing commercial buildings about how to make their project greener. And what we found from experience is the earlier we are involved, the easier this whole situation is. So at phase uh, rebus stages um, uh, one, two, and three, um, we should be looking at doing feasibility studies. Um, helping with initial energy and SAP calculations, um, looking at um, things like overheating analysis, uh, ventilation analysis, um, the list goes on. So TM52, TM59 for the overheating. Um, we can be looking at you know, helping you with the form, the orientation of the building, um, making sure that the windows are the, have the right G value, that you know, right things are specified um, at that very high level, um, you know, just building the design intent. Once that design intent has been um, finalised, then we can obviously move on to um, giving you a sort of detailed design specification and um, and getting all the way through to a sort of tender package, which can then go out to installers. Um, those installers then look at all that uh, information, come back with prices, which we can then obviously review. Um, we can check that, that, um, that, that what they're coming back with actually meets the specification and we can provide um, project oversight and subsidy assistance um, throughout the project. And then finally, at uh, stage seven, we can provide energy monitoring. We can provide feedback, which then goes all the way back around to helping you with your following concept designs um, so that you've designed best of the buildings. Um, so, you know, you kind of get to create this virtuous circle. Um, so, you know, we want to not think of it, unless it's set out as a linear project timeline, actually, we want to, uh, to see these projects um, becoming more of a sort of circular thing, which then feed into following projects. So that, that concludes my, um, my presentation. Um, I would hope there will be a number of questions that have come out of that. This is a really quick whistle stop tour. Um, so thank you for listening. Yes, thank you, David. Uh, yeah, very uh, interesting, and and certainly a whistle stop tour. I think I'm sure there's a few a few questions um, about one or two things. There's there's a handful there, but if uh, if you do have any questions, by all means put them in the Q and A box, and uh, we can go through them from there. So um, there's an initial question from um, Fernando uh, Colado. Uh, I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Uh, apologies if I haven't. Um, uh, um, they're asking how much more expensive is a ball hole GSHP um, compared to the horizontal collectors that you've described here? Um, so bore holes, um, they are typically about one and a half times the cost of um, of a horizontal collector system. I've you know this is a very very rough um, rough thing um, with a with a bore hole collector. Um, installation one of the main costs is actually getting the borehole drilling rig to site um, so with very large commercial installations you'll nearly always find they're done on boreholes partly because of the availability of, of the you know sufficient amounts of land um, but also you've obviously got the drilling rig on site and it's set up and and it's then relatively quick um, to, to drill multiple boreholes um, so, so the answer is it, it does depend on the scale of the project. Um, but as a, you know, if I had to say, give a rough figure, I'd say it's about probably one and a half times the cost of, of horizontal. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple of questions from uh, uh, Meg Hodgson here, who is our, our, our vice chair. His first question is, what is the depth of the depth range required for the uh, ground horse? Uh, GS uh, HP system. Um, I'm assuming it, this is the surface one, a horizontal one, rather than the. Yeah. Um, yeah, sounds like it. 
Um, so generally speaking, you would install the collectors at around um, between one and 1.2 meters down. Um, the, the reason for that depth range is the, that if you go too shallow, um, first of all, you know, he's sort of identified it really with the cattle farming um, thing is, is he obviously you could get mechanical damage um, mm -hmm. to the pipework. But also the other the other issue is that um, is that the top few um, centimeters of ground vary in temperature quite a lot over the year. And what you're mm -hmm. wanting to do is you're wanting to get into a into a range into a sort of layer where um, you're well outside the frost zone where where the the temperature is relatively stable throughout the year. And the reason for bottoming out at 1.2 meters is more of a health and safety uh, thing from the installation side. Um, is that if you go below 1.2 meters, you have to shore up the um, the sides of the trenches, and obviously that adds a significant amount of cost and time. Mm -hmm. um, so for most installations, between one and 1.2 meters is a kind of sweet spot where you're outside of the um, the damage stroke um, temperature varying levels at the top, and you're within what you can do without having to shore the sides of, of trenches up. Okay. Uh, that that seems fairly sensible. Um, he he then goes on to ask, um, when should we expect glass batteries to hit the renewable market? Is that is that something you know much about? Um, it's not something I know an awful lot about. Um, there are a number of different um, battery technologies that are sort of being tested at the moment. Um, I mean, even within, you know, so-called lithium ion batteries, there's there's a whole host of different um, a whole host of different uh, batteries available um, mm -hmm. and they all have advantages and disadvantages. Um, I've seen um, batteries that require um, very high levels of heat to, to um, but then give huge outputs. Um, that have to be you know, very heavy and therefore wouldn't be suitable for a lot of applications. Um, but obviously in a domestic setting or within a, a, a building setting might be work very well. The, I think the, the honest answer is let's wait until, you know, let's wait and see what happens. I personally think that it's probably a little bit too early to start investing um, in battery storage for mm. most people. Um, I, I did outline a kind of one one particular group where it might make sense where you've got where you've got a, a couple who are out of the house most of the day then it can make economic sense yeah. um but for most people the, the sort of the, the the way that it was explained to me was at the moment it's costing you about 10 pence per kilowatt hour uh, to store a kilowatt hour of, of, of electricity um if you you know divide up the cost of a battery over the, its lifetime um at the moment, you can sell electricity to the grid for about five pence per kilowatt hour, and you can buy electricity for about 15 pence per kilowatt hour, which costs you about 10 pence. So on that basis, a battery is almost certainly going to be cost neutral. Yeah, yeah. Um, so why would you invest in something that's going to not give you a, a benefit? Um, obviously, wholesale costs of electricity vary all the time. They're always changing. You know, the... the, the um, you know the, the grid make the grid makeup of electricity is is changing all the time as well. You know it's more wind, more uh, more wind, more solar, um, uh, nuclear. Obviously, there's there's new nuclear plants being built. You know, so there's there's all kinds of different things that feed into that that mix. Okay, so for the moment, batteries are, are in. Uh, let's say about. Years. I, I would say it's it's I would say it's it's something to do probably more for the backup um side of it rather than for a purely economic side of it okay um uh okay thanks for that michael uh alan wallers uh, asks or, or highlights what, what are the payback periods for each of these options in terms of i guess when they get to the did you, did you previously highlight that i'm i may have missed that or... um th there's i mean the the sort of the, the one that's sort of easy to quantify is um, is PV. Uh, you mm. you tend to get about a ten percent um, return on investment on that, so it pays back in about ten years, um, and the life of the system is about uh, twenty to twenty five years. Um, the other technologies, it's much harder to quantify that without 
knowing more about the individual building that it's being applied to. Right, okay. um, the reason being that the efficiency of heat pumps, for example, will vary with flow temperature. Um, so if you have a building which is optimized for a heat pump, then it will pay back an awful lot more quickly than um, a system where you're retrofitting um, to a to a to a to a heat emitter system that was say originally designed for a boiler and therefore much higher flow temperatures, okay. um, where you'll get a lower coefficient performance and hence the the the, the savings are much smaller. Um, but that's that's the kind of thing we look at at that feasibility at stage one, stage two um, about, you know, that's why we don't always have one size fits all type scenario, you know, because because it is different for every building. OK, thanks. Um, so moving on, um, David, it asks um, what capacity would be advisable for batteries? Um, he already has uh, 4.8 kilowatt hours installed and is going up to. 7.2 or is planning to uh, would you consider this too much or, or would you have a, a different number come to mind um i think the 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 um again that's a that's a bit of a how long is a piece of string type question um the the best thing to do would be to look at how much electricity you're exporting and how much you're importing um and and then you size the battery so that you um, so that you sort of optimize to that. You know, ideally, if you're if you're not exporting any electricity, there will be very little point in putting a bigger battery in because yeah. because obviously you're not, you know there's nothing to go into it to store um, unless you've got a particularly good variable rate tariff uh, electricity tariff where you can charge the battery from the mains. Um, at times when it's very cheap to buy electricity off, you know, uh, um, uh, sort of at, at low wholesale prices. Um, I mean, there are tariffs like that. Um, the octopus, um, uh, the octopus energy tariff, um, which na the name of which completely escapes me at the moment, um, which tracks the wholesale cost of electricity and gives you a different tariff every half an hour, um, nice. can make that system work. Yeah. Um, but those are pretty rare at the moment, those tariffs. OK. Um, OK, uh, thanks for those, David. Um, so David Russell now, on air, air source heat, pump, heat units, I have heard in the past that because of the condensation, particularly in the UK, issues uh, in the units, they have need, <clears throat> excuse me, they have needed to be purged, uh, which is um, using energy which is uh, effectively wasted or could be considered to be wasted. Is this is still an issue or is, is the technology improved since this? Um, so the answer to that is that, um, that there's, that air source heat pumps do need to defrost. Um, they will typically defrost uh, two or three times an hour. Um, the, the, the heat exchange that the air goes over is, is below freezing. So, so you'll get condensation onto that. Um, onto that uh, heat exchanger and then that that condensation will eventually freeze um, if you did nothing about it then that would actually block the heat exchanger and stop the heat pump from working um, so they do reverse cycle and then and then defrost um, that is all taken into account in the coefficient of performance figures that are published um, the the thing to remember is that you get latent heat back from the water that condenses on that on that um uh that heat exchanger in the first place um so although it it looks like you're wasting energy actually you've kind of gained that energy on one hand and then given it back on another hand um so you do actually end up with a small net gain from the the high humidity that we we experience in the uk okay great um so uh, fernando uh, again are there any any soil types or conditions such as the water table that can affect uh, a GSHP? Uh, or, yes. Yeah. The... Um, so, uh, as a as a sort of very general rule, um, the the damper the soil, um, the better a ground source heat pump will work. Um, so, what you need to what what we do when we're sizing the collectors for a ground source heat pump is we will take into account um, 
the ground conditions. Um, water is one of the sort of primary things that moves heat into the area around the collector. So that, that's rainwater, as I said, you know, which is why you can't put horizontal collectors under an, under you know an impermeable driveway, for example. Um, but but generally damper areas, you know. So if you had a boggy area, that would be very good. You get a very good extraction rate from that. Um, if you had a very sort of dry, sandy soil, and um, then you get a relatively poor extraction rate. What that means in practice is not that you can't use a ground source heat pump in a dry, sandy area, but what you will need is you'll need a greater area of collectors um, for the same size heat pump. Does that make any difference to efficiency? Um, not a huge amount. Um, it will slightly increase your parasitic losses from the pumps. You need to circulate the brine, um, the, 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 the uh, mixture of water and glycol around that collector system. Um, so, but it's a relatively small effect. Okay, um, thanks for that. Uh, next question is from Leah. Uh, thanks for the presentation, it's good. Um, you mentioned that the GSHP don't require planning. Um, do you know if this is also the case uh, within uh, green belt or areas of natural beauty um, and kind of more sensitive uh, external spaces, I guess? Um, I don't know about um, areas of outstanding natural beauty. Um, in uh, green belts, um, it's basically as long as as long as you're not yeah, because you're putting the collectors in once and then and then effectively returning the yeah. You know, there's no permanent change to the visual appearance. Um, the answer is you don't need to have planning permission. Um, I guess I guess the the sort of is and why you'd ever have this, but. I guess if you were ever looking to say have a, 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 a site of special scientific interest or something like that, where you'd sort of permanently damage the um, uh, potentially permanently damage the ecology of the area, then I guess they, you know, there would be some fairly difficult questions to answer. Mm. Um, but but for most sites, you don't need um, uh, don't need planning permission. As with all these things, you know check with your local planning department it will probably be require nothing more than a, an email just to say i'm thinking of doing this is there any problem with that do i need permission um mm -hmm. and usually if you ask the question then they're much more welcoming than if you do something you're not allowed to do and then they have to come do enforcement yes of course yeah ask first um, yeah okay uh, that's a good question leah um, um, actually, one thing on that is that when yeah. you apply for the renewable heat incentive, they do actually ask you for a letter um, from the planning authority anyway, saying you don't need to have planning permission to do this installation. Um, so you have to you have to contact the planning authority anyway just to get that letter, so you get access to the RHI funding, even though yeah. you don't technically need to have planning permission. Yeah, okay. I, th I think it's I think it's a it's a something that was put in because at some stage somebody managed to successfully apply for RHI funding for something that didn't actually comply with planning permission. Um, so they put this sort of extra hurdle you have to, to jump in. Okay, so David Simmons asks, uh, is it possible to install a GSHP below the footprint of the building itself? Uh, at a lower depth than the foundations, uh, if if the site is more restricted than than perhaps ideal, um, I have seen that done um, uh, in a couple of different ways. Um, either with um, sort of mini piles that have um, uh, so you so you have a, a sort of a, a whole raft of sort of mini piles that have small collectors in them. Mm -hmm. um, but equally, I have also heard of it done, being done um with with boreholes as well um you obviously what you can't do is you can't have a, a flat loop um collector underneath the building because again as i said for the same reasons that it doesn't work under impermeable surfaces it doesn't work under a building there's no no there's nothing there to sort of renew the heat going into that area uh, yeah. but when you're talking about you know about boreholes and much deeper um systems obviously then sort of groundwater flows and things that start coming into it and into into play so yes it's possible it's possible but but quite expensive, <laughs> expensive yes. okay then um 
So another question from Mick. Uh, on a larger scale, how much of the UK energy is made up of renewable sources at the moment? Is And, and presumably that's increasing, but do you, do you have... Um, so it, it, it varies day to day, um, but mm. the sort of headline figure is that we're approaching 50% of electricity now being generated from renewable sources. Oh, um, there is actually a little app you can download on your phone uh, for free, which, which will tell you what the makeup is at any given moment. Um, but as a, you know, we went for a quite a significant period um, uh, up to, I think about a month ago, where we use no coal at all to generate, to generate power for quite some time. Um, there is a, still a significant amount of natural gas being used to produce electricity. Um, mm. There's there's a small amount, a small and probably increasing amount of nuclear being used. Um, but offshore wind is is becoming one of the big um, providers, as is and solar is obviously increasing as well. Um, but mm. but you know when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, then we still rely on burning stuff, unfortunately. Um, okay, another one from Alan. Uh, can you talk about the de degradation? So I'll, I'll try that again. Degradation uh, rates of heat pump systems over time. Uh, does a borehole stay more efficient than a shallow system for for longer, or uh, are they about the same? Um, so, if you design a collector system correctly, um, then then it should. It, you will get a small drop off in performance over the first couple of years, and then it should stabilize and and then f effectively stay the same for for forever. Um, you do hear of horror stories of people freezing the ground um, with with ground source heat pumps, um, and as a general rule, it's because somebody has got their calculations wrong. Um, the temptation is always to put less. Um, pipe in the ground because obviously it's cheaper and unfortunately we live in a world where it's a competitive market for doing installations and installers try and you know try and be the cheapest by not necessarily um you know being quite as diligent as they should be about about how much pipe they put in the ground um what can i say about so I mean, there are rules of thumb calculations you can do um, for yourself to sort of double check what, what people are telling you. Um, you know, it's sort of reasonable. Um, the reason that the installers can get away with that is because if you're if you get the sizing a little bit wrong, you're not going to realize for a few years that something's not quite right. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's one of those things where you can where a a shoddy installer can hide their poor work for long enough to get well away from the area. Um, you know, unlike a gas boiler where it's going to be fairly obvious if it's not, not working straight away. Um, that damage is a sort of longer term, longer term thing. I, I did, for example, have a, um, a, somebody phoned us once and said that they had had a ground source heat pump installed on their front and the collector was under their front lawn and that every winter the front lawn became very uneven and then they phoned and uh, and they'd realized something was really wrong when they turned the tap on and no water came out of the tap and it's because they'd managed to actually freeze the water main coming into the house um and the reason that the front lawn was coming uneven was because they were freezing the ground and then over the summer it was just defrosting and you're actually getting ground heave from the uh from the ground sort of freezing and unfreezing um, and unfortunately, the only way of curing that is to actually um, is to actually then extend the existing collector system. But of course, you then have to oversize, the, effectively oversize the system to allow the bit you've already damaged to recover. Um, so, you, so you kind of end up in a worse point to, 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 you know, from where you start, the, where you would have done if you'd done it right first time. Yeah. Uh, okay, there's there's a couple of questions left, uh, I think. Um, one by one from Patrick. Um, is the passive house standard of air change per hour the best rate of air change to aim for, or would you recommend something else? Um, that's a really good one. I mean, passive house 
has some fantastic benefits to it um but it is quite a restrictive standard um in terms of air change rates i would always you know i would always tend to go back to let's start with part where what part f says our our, our air changes are because that's that's you know obviously legally what we have to do and make sure we build, meet building regulations um passive house you know, you you basically can't build a passive house without having some sort of mvhr system um but yeah i mean it's, it's probably as good a place to start as any um as long as you're complying with part f as well yeah okay great um i think the last question now um from aisha uh in your opinion, how far is the renewable energy market prepared to meet uh, the ROBA's target uh, of 75% reduction of operational energy by 2030? Well, we've been doing a lot of work on REBA 2030. Um, and again, uh, you know, I'd sort of say, go and have a look on our, our YouTube channel and, and, um, and have a look at some of the other presentations we do on, on uh, REBA 2030. Um, in terms of the uh, the meeting the energy side, that's actually relatively straightforward to do with with some with renewable technologies. The difficult bit is to meet that at the same time as doing all the embodied carbon things and all the water saving mm -hmm. things and all the other bits. Um, meeting one bit of that that REBA standard is is quite easy it's it's when you try and do them all at the same time it starts becoming more challenging yeah. um the bit that we actually think is is the hardest is that um is that a lot of the um building products that are used as sort of insulation materials at the moment have quite high embodied carbon in them mm. so if you're trying to drive down embodied carbon while simultaneously improving insulation you then have to start looking at completely different building techniques from what we're used to. Um, so, yeah, you, there's there's um, uh, there's there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of, of of interesting work in there, um, and that's something that that um, again I'm gonna I'm gonna shout out another mesh thing, but um, we have a free um, online carbon calculator for embodied carbon. Um, that goes into different uh, makeups. Um, it's just a simple Excel spreadsheet, um, but that enables you to look at different constructions and what the potential embodied carbon is within those different construction materials. Um, that's very much designed as sort of stage one, stage two type calculator. Uh, we have a much more detailed calculator that we use um, called One Click LCA for doing um, for doing sort of the more detailed stuff at sort of stage three, stage four. Yeah, of course. Um, okay, there's a final comment from David. Um, you haven't, uh, he's asking, you haven't mentioned any of the delivery of the heat into the building, either underfloor or via radiators. Is there, um, are there, are there technologies there that would complement the, the collection of the, the energy to? Yeah, um, so I mean, David's quite, quite right um, that, um, the lower uh, the flow temperature you get to take from a heat pump, um, then the higher the efficiency you you will get. Um, so the ideal is underfloor heating um, mm -hmm. because that gives you the lowest flow temperature um, for the for the output that you need to keep the building warm. Um, that is then followed by fan convector radiators um, and for a well insulated house um uh, even standard radiators can be used um although you know you're generally looking at double double um skin double convector radiators of a reasonably large size there's obviously also high output radiators made by people like uh, jaeger um who which are really really good as well um yeah but but our first stop would always be is it possible to do underfloor heating and you know kind of if no then then we start looking at fan convectors and we start looking at oversizing um conventional radiators um mm. but there will be a small a small knock-on effect from from the, either of those two choices okay um i think we'll have uh 
one last question, which is uh, from Susie. Um, thanks for a very comprehensive presentation. Um, I'm looking at active houses with uh, wood insulation and timber frames. I've been looking at uh, foil solar and we have uh, hydroelectric capacity too. Do you have any uh, recommendations or suggestions with? Um, well, it's certainly something we can we can help you with, Susie. Um, I, I would probably refer you in the first instance to my colleague Richard, um, because Richard is is our guru on on all the different building um, uh, on all the different building techniques and the um, embodied carbon side and that kind of thing. Um, but yes, I mean yeah, that's absolutely something that that would be right up our street and the kind of thing we the kind of project we'd really love to get involved in um so so you know um drop me an email um and and uh, we'll see what we can do okay um yeah i think we'll leave it there uh i don't think there's anything else um so once again thank you from the ndsa for for joining us this evening i hope everyone who's uh, still with us has enjoyed it and um found it informative um I think we've got we've got another three presentations this month. Uh, our next one is a, another practice profile with uh, Office uh, Sean, um, and then after that we're we're coming back up to Nottingham to for a presentation with uh, Jessica Wiles on the the Nottingham Island uh, project that they're currently engaged with um, in the centre of Nottingham. So hopefully you'll be all interested in that and, and will join us then. The tickets are all available on our website. And um, yeah, uh, look forward to those, seeing you again. Okay, thank you, uh, David. Thank you.